Welcome to another round of 2D Mat, 2D Materials in Tribology. Today with Professor Claudia Rigi, who will talk about advancing solid interfaces and lubricants by first principles materials design, and Professor Mehmet Baikara, who will present his talk Nanotribology of MOS2 from atomic scale ripples to chemical dopants. Before we start, we want to thank our sponsors for their support. We are sponsored by the two MDPI journals Codings and Lubricants, as well as Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Arctic Instruments. from Chile, uh, good afternoon to, to Italy and to Europe, uh, good morning to, to California. We have a very international uh, webinar today, um, so I welcome you all uh, to the first webinar uh, of 2D Mat, 2D Materials in Tribology in 2022. So first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a very successful uh, new year with all, a lot of health, uh, which is uh, particularly important in all this pandemic situation. And we have two exciting talks today. Uh, the first one given um, by Clelia, the second one given by, by Mehmet. Uh, and I would like to give the word uh, to Philip uh, to introduce properly uh, Clelia now. Yeah, good evening from Vienna, also from my side. And uh, I hope you are all well. Thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, my name is Philip Grützmacher. I'm together with Andreas Rosenkranz, the co-host for 2D Mat, 2D Materials in Tribology. And um, today, first talk, we will start with Professor Clelia Rigi, who is a full professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Bologna. And she is also a visiting professor at the Imperial College London. Her research activity focuses on the application and development of computational methods for understanding chemical reactions activated by mechanical stresses and also for designing materials to reduce friction. And here, of course, Clelia is also interested in 2D materials as new potential lubricants, why she is here today. Since 2019, she also holds an ERC grant titled Advancing Solid Interfaces and Lubricants by First Principles Material Design, which will also be the title of her talk today. And with that, I give the word to Clelia. Clelia, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip and Andreas, for uh, this uh, invitation and for your uh, wishes for the next year. So let me share my screen. Can you see my presentation in uh, uh, presentation mode? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I have split my presentation in two parts. Uh, the first part is focused on uh, MXENs. Uh, probably you have already uh, heard previous top, uh, talks uh, on uh, uh, these materials in this web uh, uh, series. Um, I just want to recall briefly that uh, this family of uh, uh, nitrites and uh, carbides uh, are attracting uh, a lot of interest uh, for uh, their um, um, very good uh, uh, performance in many applications and the variety of uh, technological applications where they can be used uh, uh, is due to the tunability of their uh, chemical composition and also structure in terms of thickness. Uh, so uh, the usual way of uh, uh, representing uh, uh, enzymes in a formula is this one. Uh, can you see my mouse as a pointer? Yeah, yeah, we see your mouse. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, where M indicates the transition metal, X is uh, carbon or nitrogen, and T determination uh, at the surface of the layers. 
and zinc can, have, uh, can be composed of different atomic planes, so have different thickness. They are uh, produced from uh, three-dimensional uh, precursors by uh, removing uh, the A um, group uh, elements here indicated with uh, uh, etching uh, solutions, uh, by etching thanks to acidic uh, aqueous solutions. And uh, um, the composition of the surface termination typically uh, depends very much on the etching conditions and the etching type and concentration. Uh, usually, uh, it's difficult to control the composition of uh, the uh, termination of uh, enzymes, and they are um, composed by a, a mixture of uh, uh, typically fluorine, hydroxyl group, and oxygen atoms. So the, the large uh, tunability of uh, the chemical composition and structure of uh, enzyme makes them very appealing for computational high throughput computational studies based on first principle calculations. This kind of uh, uh, approach, high throughput approach, allows to calculate materials properties in uh, um, for a, a large number of materials in parallel in an automatized way and screen the, uh, the properties that are more uh, and, uh, and identify those that are most suitable for particular applications. Here we are focusing on uh, tribological applications and uh, by first principle calculations we um, uh, calculated the, the uh, two interfacial properties that are relevant for the use of these materials as solid lubricants that are uh, interfacial adhesion and uh, uh, potential corrugation that is related to interlayer sliding. Uh, the, uh, the interlayer adhesion that is the opposite of the work of separation defined as the energy required to separate the two layers um, from contact can be obtained by first principle calculation simply by subtracting to the total energy of the bilayer the energy of the two single layers and dividing uh, this difference by the area of the unit cell. So this is a, a work of separation is typically an energy per unit area. Uh, by calculating this uh, addition energy as a function of the relative lateral position of the two layers, we construct the potential energy surface uh, that uh, describes as the addition energy changes during the lateral displacement of the layers. And the potential corrugation that is uh, uh, the difference between uh, uh, the minima and the maxima of these potential energy surfaces um, represent the maximum energy barrier that uh, should be overcome when moving one layer um, along the other. So it's very much related to the ideal shear strength that we actually calculate as the derivative of the potential profile, usually. Okay, so uh, we um, use the DFT approach for describing uh, um, uh, these uh, materials uh, where the exchange correlation function was uh, uh, described uh, with the PBE uh, approximation. But this is not enough. As you can see here, uh, PBE does not predict, for example, binding between uh, uh, to um, enzyme oxygen terminated uh, because of the well-known problem of DFT in uh, describing the uh, non-local interactions, in particular the Van der Waals uh, interactions. Uh, so we uh, consider different corrections uh, to PB, including uh, D2 by Grimm, D3, and other uh, fully ab initio methods to uh, include this correction. And uh, we also compare the results with the high level theory methods, such as uh, the random phase approximation, 
and the second order the Muller placed the perturbation theory that uh, uh, were calculated for Bruce Height and Portland Light. And the results that we obtained both for these materials that allowed us to compare with higher level theories and for MZIN, uh, taking also as important reference the scan method, allowed us to select as an optimal approach for, uh, this, uh, for our study, uh, also optimal, but also computational uh, affordable approach, the PBE uh, corrected by uh, the uh, Grimm uh, method, but where uh, the parameters, uh, the C6 parameter coefficient and uh, uh, Van der Waals radius are uh, um, uh, of titaniums are replaced by those of the uh, preceding Nobel gas, that is argon. This approach, as, as you can see, uh, provides good results. So is an ad hoc correction because otherwise uh, Van der Waals interaction would have been overestimated by standard Grimm method. So this initial uh, study uh, on uh, best computational setup to describe these materials was very important because interlayer properties are very much uh, dependent on, on the choice of the Van der Waals uh, interactions. Um, then we consider a uh, bilayer of enzymes with different terminations um, because the aim of our study was precisely to identify the effect of the uh, termination on interlayer adhesion and uh, um, potential corrugation. So uh, we consider three types of interfaces the, uh, those that you can see in the first row are homogeneous interfaces that are obtained by mating two identical terminated enzymes uh, by fluorine atoms, the first panel, oxygen atoms in the second, and hydroxyl group in the third panel. In the second row, we consider what we uh, define as heterogeneous interfaces, where uh, uh, two homogeneous surfaces of different kind are uh, mated. So in this case, oxygen against hydroxyl group and so on. The last uh, situation that we took into account was that of mixed interfaces, where each uh, enzyme surface contain a mixture of uh, um, chemical groups, uh, oxygen, hydroxyl groups, and uh, fluorine atoms. With in, in different stoichiometric ratios. These uh, are the most realistic terminations. Also speaking with uh, uh, our experimental collaborators, we understood that uh, this is the typical situation that is obtained after the synthesis of enzyme. And they, uh, to our knowledge, have not uh, uh, already been considered uh, by DFT calculations in the literature. Um, so you, you can see here uh, the results uh, in, uh, for the work of separation that, as I said before, is the energy required to uh, separate two, two uh, enzyme layer in contact. So it represents the interlayer adhesion, the, is the opposite of the interlayer adhesion. So in the first panel, we compared, uh, we considered uh, homogeneous interfaces. Uh, fluorinated the, the, the in green, oxygen terminated in red, and uh, terminated by hydroxyl groups in, in blue. Uh, for uh, um, all uh, these uh, uh, kind of uh, bilayers, we consider both the presence of carbon or nitrogen. And we also consider enzyme uh, composed by different number of uh, atomic planes. So enzyme layers of different thickness. You can see that uh, the uh, presence of carbon and hydrogen or, or nitrogen does not uh, um, have a significant uh, 
uh, effect on interlayer adhesion, as well as the thickness of uh, the single and, and thin layer. It doesn't uh, change very much the, um, the, the adhesion, uh, the interlayer adhesion. What uh, uh, gives a, a, a major role, what has a, man, a major role is the termination. As you can see, the uh, interlayer adhesion increases as uh, um, the termination changes from uh, fluorine oxygen to uh, hydroxylated layers. And um, yes, uh, and this is even more evident for uh, mixed and heterogeneous interfaces that are considered in the other panels. In the second panel, we consider um, M-thin bilayers terminated uh, with fluorine and oxygen atom. Uh, we consider both hetero interfaces, that is the column uh, here indicated by two vertical stripes, where an homogeneous surface of oxygen atom is mated to a, a fluorinated surface. Uh, and we also consider uh, mixed terminations where the uh, concentration of fluorine atoms uh, increased from 25% to 75%. Uh, in the, so you can see that for this kind of uh, interfaces, the, the uh, work of adhesion is, is very low, uh, even lower for of that obtained for graphene and molybdenum disulfide. So in, in uh, both for homogeneous interfaces and uh, uh, heterogeneous or mixed interfaces, that do not contain hydroxyl groups, so just containing fluorine atom or oxygen atoms, the work of separation is very, very low, independently from uh, carbon and nitrogen or from the thickness of the mixing layer. And these are very, um, let's say, uh, weakly coupled layers, more weakly coupled than gra graphene layers or molybdenum disulfide layers. The situation changes when hydroxyl groups are present. You can see in the third panel that in addition to fluorine atoms, hydroxyl groups are present, both as heterogeneous interfaces, uh, the column uh, here at the center, or as a mixture of uh, um, uh, terminations with an increasing number of hydroxyl groups. And uh, um, in the last panel, the same analysis is performed by mixing hydroxyl group and oxygen atoms. Uh, so it's clearly visible that the presence of hydroxyl group makes interlayer adhesion uh, much higher, especially in the presence of oxygen the, and the hydroxyl group uh, than for the other enzyme layers. Uh, so then we analyze the uh, nature of these uh, interactions. And uh, mm, uh, so here you can see the relaxed structure of these uh, enzyme bilayers, uh, where also the partial charges accumulated to the surface atoms are indicated. So you can see that fluorine and oxygen atoms present negative partial charges. And so uh, uh, their interaction that uh, in the panel F is represented as a function of distance is clearly dominated by a high repulsive interaction at short range and weak attraction, Van der Waals attraction uh, at larger uh, distances. So this gives rise to this shallow minima. While for homogeneous uh, interfaces containing uh, hydroxyl groups, in addition to the above mentioned interaction, there are also dipole-dipole interactions that make the minima more, more deep. Uh, um, while when we consider uh, 
um, different uh, atomic species, in particular, here are represented the hydroxyl group and oxygen atoms, both in a heterogeneous configuration and a mixed configuration. Uh, uh, hydrogen bonding uh, is formed, hydrogen bonds are formed uh, across the interface. And this makes uh, the, uh, this minimum much deeper than the other cases. So these uh, different kind of interactions that are clearly uh, evident uh, from the calculated partial charges and from this trend of uh, the uh, layer A interaction as a function of distance make clear that the, the reason why the presence of hydroxyl group will increase the interlayer adhesion. The partial charges on titanium are, uh, of course, positive, ranging from 1.6 electron to 2. Uh, and those uh, um, on the uh, inner carbon atom are, again, negative, uh, ranging between minus 0.9 to minus 0.7. Uh, electrons. Okay, then uh, we uh, calculated as this uh, uh, addition energy changes as a function of uh, the relative lateral position uh, of the two layer. So uh, we repeated the calculation of interlayer addition by displacing one uh, layer uh, with respect to the other, to the, um, to the other one, and uh, Due to the fact that these layers uh, contain uh, different uh, chemical species, uh, so have uh, an, a bonding configuration that is more complex, for example, than that present in graphene or molybdenum disulfide, we couldn't uh, uh, consider just uh, the usual symmetry sites on top, hollow bridge. We had to consider a denser grid of uh, sites to be sampled for constructing accurate potential energy surfaces. Uh, the, the, the considered points are represented in this panel at the top left of the slide, while in the first row, you can see what the results obtained for um, titanium carbide and zinc terminating by um, hydroxyl group. And uh, the calculation and in the sorry and, and in the lower uh, picture, uh, the pass is obtained for uh, fluorinated uh, uh, enzymes, uh, homogeneous interfaces. Um, there is the, the, the calculation has been repeated for uh, an increasing value of the load applied. So we uh, repeated this calculation in different lateral position by applying vertical forces of uh, opposite sign to the two layers and relaxing for every applied uh, load the interlayer distance. So you see that uh, uh, for uh, the uh, hydroxyl terminated mxin, a red color appears indicating a higher corrugation, a much higher corrugation than the fluorinated bilayer, uh, where the pass remains almost flat, even at very high load applied. So this uh, picture summarizes the results that we obtained for all the considered uh, MZIN interfaces. On the left, uh, we uh, uh, report the potential corrugation, as I said, the difference between the maxima and the minima of the potential energy surface that represent the maximum energy barrier that should be overcome during sliding in the, the absence of any applied load. While on the right, we uh, see the effect of load. So for every uh, bilayer, MZIN bilayer, we uh, 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 consider how uh, the load increase uh, the potential corrugation. So again, you can see that uh, for uh, enzyme without uh, hydroxyl group in determination, uh, the corrugation at zero applied load is very, very small. 
even smaller in the same range of that of graphene and smaller uh, uh, than the corrugation calculated for molybdenum disulfide. So these enzymes are very uh, appealing for uh, uh, as a solid lubricant because uh, they present uh, a slipperiness uh, according to our calculation that should be comparable to that of graphene and even lower than that of molybdenum disulfide. And uh, by applying a load, this uh, enzyme without uh, uh, the presence of hydroxyl group do not show um, an increase, a significant increase of uh, the corrugation. So they maintain their good slipperiness even in the presence of high applied load. Uh, for, um, the situation is different for enzyme containing hydroxyl group, uh, where, especially when they are phased to oxygen atom where the adhesion is higher, as I said before, because of the presence of hydrogen bonding. And usually, as it usually happens, a higher adhesion corresponds to a higher potential corrugation that is higher uh, resistance to sliding. So it would be very nice uh, to uh, improve the possibility to control determination of the uh, enzyme layers, because from according to our results, enzyme uh, without hydroxyl group can be very, very appealing, uh, are very appealing for uh, uh, tribological application as solid lubricants. Okay, so this uh, slide uh, summarizes the results. So our density functional theory calculations that uh, have been corrected by Van der Waals ad hoc Van der Waals interactions that are able to reproduce high level uh, theory methods for uh, describing uh, uh, the non local interactions, uh, demonstrate that the interfacial properties of titanium based enzyme can be significantly improving by reducing hydroxyl group on determination. And that uh, uh, fluorine or uh, uh, oxygen terminated enzyme show very low adhesion and corrugation. Uh, the corrugation, uh, the, the, the adhesion is lower than that um, uh, calculated for graphene and molybdenum disulfide. And, uh, um, and also the corrugation is, uh, is very low. Uh, so, as I already said, by controlling the surface termination by post-synthesis treatments uh, will be the key to, to improve the tribological performance, the nano-tribological performances of these materials, because we are here, again, I want to stress this concept, uh, speaking about uh, uh, tribological proper interlayer sliding. So, uh, tribological properties that uh, uh, are uh, affect the behavior of enzyme uh, as solid lubricants. Okay. Um, for nanoscale application, another story is, uh, for example, uh, uh, the use of uh, enzyme uh, in macroscale applications, where as a paper published by Andreas and others show that uh, tribofilm are formed. So there is uh, a chemistry, a, a different chemistry uh, that uh, is involved in, uh, in the, the friction reduction process. But for what concern interlayered properties, this uh, computational study highlights, uh, these computational studies that focus, focuses on realistic terminations, because uh, for the first time we consider uh, mixed termination show that uh, um, yeah, the, the absence of hydroxyl group can improve, a, a controlled uh, uh, termination of these materials can really improve their, their uh, interlayer properties. Okay, then I come to the second part uh, of my talk that is focused on the tribochemical conversion of methane to uh, graphene and other carbon-based nanostructures. This work has been uh, carried out uh, in collaboration with the group of Ali Erdermir, uh, who uh, performed 
the experiment, the experiment that is here uh, represented with this cartoon of uh, a pin on disk uh, tribometer uh, in the presence of methane molecule, uh, molecules. So, so you can see that uh, when uh, the disk was in, in the coating, uh, they observed a um, significant friction uh, reduction uh, with respect to uh, steel on steel in the same condition. Uh, and uh, uh, the transmission electromicroscopy images uh, that they acquired clearly show uh, that uh, nano onions or um, graphene layers or other nanostructure are formed. And these are most likely the, the, uh, the reasons, the, the formation of this structure uh, underlying the observed reduction of friction and wear. Uh, so we investigated the atomistic mechanism underlying these experimental observations by performing um, ab initio molecular dynamic simulations of sliding nickel interfaces interacting with uh, methane molecules. Uh, these simulations are uh, fully ab initio, that means that uh, uh, the electronic degrees of freedom are fully taken into account. So the chemistry and the conditions of the enhanced reactivity that are present in when mechanical stresses are applied, molecules are confined in small spaces, are fully, that are also mechanisms of quantum mechanical origin, are fully taken into account. Uh, we model the um, sliding velocity, a load applied, and a temperature, um, uh, constant temperature in our simulation. So you can see what uh, uh, the result of our simulation here from uh, a lateral view and this uh, from a top view, a top view of the substrate. We remove the above surface of nickel. And uh, you can uh, uh, see, I can uh, start again this simulation, that uh, the hydrogen atoms uh, immediately detach from uh, some molecules and diffuses into the nickel uh, bulk. Uh, so a process of molecular dehydrogenation starts very quickly. And um, small hydrocarbons are formed, you can see, uh, uh, this ethylene or other uh, small hydrocarbon molecules are formed. And um, um, the, the chains that I, I can go on with the second simulation, where uh, we increase the concentration of carbon atoms since uh, uh, we saw from the previous simulation that hydrogen diffuses into the bulk, so the concentration of carbon atoms increases. So we observe that uh, the carbon chains increases their length until uh, every carbon atom had been included into a branch and the chain become cross-linked, forming an amorphous film of low density. And the continuous uh, uh, application of a load and the shear uh, reduced more and more the thickness of this film. And uh, as you can see uh, in, in the th third simulation, uh, when the thin thickness is reduced, a change of hybridization of uh, the carbon atoms take place. They start to uh, transform from cross-linked chains to rings where the carbon atoms start to acquire an sp2 hybridization. And these rings, uh, you can see some of them appearing here, another here, uh, start to form a small graphene flake. Um, another is appearing here. So the effect of load and shear 
change the carbon hybridization and uh, transform the cross-linked chain in uh, a graphene flake. Indeed, at the end, this uh, graphene flake that we uh, obtained for the small duration of this simulation, we are speaking about eight picoseconds. So uh, if we let the simulation go on, uh, probably we uh, could see the transformation of all the graphene into all the carbon into graphene, uh, an extended graphene flake, but already is clearly visible. And uh, um, the radial distribution function that uh, we calculated for um, uh, this system uh, that uh, is uh, represented uh, in, uh, in red, uh, uh, clearly show, uh, uh, no, sorry, in B, this uh, uh, system containing the flake, uh, clearly show a, a shift uh, from the radial distribution function of the main peak uh, calculated here for a cross-linked chains that was centered at 1.43 Enstrom, that is a typical length of uh, SP bond, to one point. Uh, uh, 46, that is the typical length of SP2 uh, bond graphene flake. And the comparison with the, uh, the radial distribution function calculated for graphene uh, on nickel uh, clearly indicates that uh, um, there is a formation of a graphene flake uh, similar to the um, uh, ideal graphene uh, structure. So in conclusion, in this second part uh, of, of the work, uh, we performed uh, a initial molecular dynamic simulations uh, to uh, unravel the um, atomistic mechanism underlying the tribological induced formation of carbon nanostruction for, from methane molecules. So we first observed the dehydrogenation of uh, uh, methane molecule. That is uh, uh, very interesting because uh, uh, the dissociation of methane on nickel is not energetically favorable in uh, standard conditions, but in these uh, tribological conditions, it happens uh, very, very quickly. And then we saw the diffusion of the hydrogen atoms into the bulk and the formation of carbon-carbon bonds that form for to uh, the, the presence of load and shear, uh, a rehybridization of, from SP to SP2 um, uh, occurs, and at the end of the simulation, a graphene flake appears as uh, uh, in agreement with what is observed in the experiment. So with this, I conclude the, uh, the presentation. I would like to thank uh, my collaborators who performed the simulations that uh, uh, I have just shown you, Edoardo Marchi and Michele Cutini uh, study enzymes, while Giulio Fatti performed the calculation on uh, tribocatalysis of methane. And I would like also to give a special thanks to our uh, experimental collaboration who suggested very um, that who gave us very important hints that are um, Andreas Rosenkraft, Baba Canizori, and uh, Ali for Mzins, and Ali Erdemir for uh, uh, the tribocatalysis. I um, would like also to thank uh, ERC for um, the slide project that I'm carrying out at uh, Bologna University. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very yes. much for the for the exciting um, presentation. Most of the presentation, I, I had some insights already, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> so um, yeah, I would like to open um, the talk of Clelia uh, for discussion. So um, as Philip has already mentioned, there are two options. You could either share uh, your question uh, via the, the message uh, option or just uh, like old school, raise the hand. Uh, and uh, ask uh, her directly. Anybody? Maybe, maybe no. to, yeah. there's already the first question popping up. I saw a question in the chat. 
Oh yeah, the question is how did authors incorporate pin and disk process parameters influence on the film in simulations? Okay, so speaking with Ali Erdemir, we learned uh, he, he suggested basically the, the load uh, and the temperature. So let me share again. Um, he, uh, yeah, speaking with him, we uh, uh, consider a high temperature because uh, of uh, frictional heating that uh, uh, he said that is uh, very often detected during these experiments. Uh, we applied a normal load of five gigapascal. And uh, why the sliding velocity is for sure higher than that uh, uh, present in the experiment, but this is um, a common uh, choice for uh, uh, tribological simulations because, uh, of course, uh, we are dealing with uh, time scales that are much shorter than a realistic time scale. So if we want to see something happen, we have to go fast. Uh, but uh, the chemistry that rules this phenomenon, as we saw, of course, in the range of picoseconds. So it's, um, it's not so dramatic, this choice, because uh, uh, tribochemical reactions are activated in uh, um, times that are very, very short. So um, it's, it's not a problem to, uh, in order to, for example, for this kind of analysis that they are qualitative analysis, we are not calculating uh, friction coefficient, but we want to see what happened there. And this is realistic because uh, chemical processes have time scales uh, that are very, very short, uh, so can be captured by our simulations uh, and uh, they are not affected by this higher velocity that we, we include the qualitative uh, description of the phenomenon. Good, thank you. There's another question, which is, are you aware of any re research that has examined the formation of vaccines in situ in liquid lubricants or is research primarily focused on dry lubrication? In situ in liquid lubricants. Ah, uh, you mean that, that thanks uh, to tribochemical processes, yeah, I think this is the background of the question, if mm. vaccines can be formed in situ. Uh, I'm not aware of any study of this kind. Mm, it would be very, very exciting uh, because uh, producing a solid lubricant in situ, it's very, really uh, a very, very smart way of uh, preventing nanosterity contact because uh, uh, you have the formation of what you need, exactly where you need it. Uh, and uh, I, I'm aware of uh, tribological induced formation of molybdenum disulfide from, uh, for example, MODTC, graphene from carbon containing molecules or um, polyphosphite films from ZADDP. Uh, but actually, I'm, I've never heard about the formation of enzyme from specific molecules or other compounds present in the interface. That would be very, a very exciting uh, research if it's not already carried out. That's true. Maybe I can add to this. Um, I mean, in situ, they haven't been formed, but they, of course, have been used as additives in lubricants. Yes. In this sense, the, the group of Jabing Lu has already published um, some additive work also with the full characterization of the interface afterwards. Um, so there's some, some research effort going on, but um, there's more focus right now on tri friction or even on, on composites. I mean, forming them in situ might also because it's a more complicated circumetric structure might be more difficult mm -hmm. than, for example, for graphene. Right. Yes. 
And then there's another question, which is uh, uh, which software was used to model interactions of the film? The model uh, we, we used uh, for um, uh, for um, to soft as well, uh, the interaction of the film. Yeah, we perform first principle calculations with Quantum Espresso, which is um, a package, open source package that uh, allows to calculate uh, interlayer adhesion and different lateral positions, so constructing the path and so on. While for a initial molecular dynamic simulations or, or in tribological conditions, we used a modified version of the born oppenheimer uh, ab initio molecular dynamics included in quantum espresso, but that we specifically modified in our group in order to uh, model sliding, uh, because uh, yes, uh, we have to uh, model two surfaces in motion and remove the energy that we put in in the system uh, by external forces. So we performed this uh, ad hoc um, modification to the computer program. And this is a non-made uh, program uh, modification, modified uh, version of the, of the born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics included in Espresso. Perfect, thanks. Um, another question is, does the hydrogen atom absorbed in nickel or alloy base material affect the material properties in terms of the fracture toughness? Uh, this is something that we have not uh, verified in these simulations that were focused on uh, the formation of uh, carbon. But uh, yeah, it's known that hydrogen can cause uh, the embrittlement of uh, metals. So um, I guess that, uh, yes, probably this, but it depends also on the amount of hydrogen that uh, is pumped in. Uh, but uh, I have not, uh, this is an interesting point uh, to uh, consider, but uh, I have not uh, specifically verified it with, with our simulations. Okay. Yeah, okay. I guess if there are not any further questions, then uh, we thank Clelia Rigi a lot again for the very insightful talk, also bringing us one step closer to understanding the fr frictional properties of vaccines. And uh, with that, I give back to Andreas, who will introduce uh, Professor Baikara now. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, very much Clelia, for the very nice uh, talk, also for the nice discussion. Um, now uh, we jump from Italy uh, directly to California, Mehmet. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mehmet, um, who is an associate professor at the University of California, Mehmet, uh, California. Mehmet did his uh, bachelor in Turkey, um, then continued uh, to move on the scientific track at Yale University, finished his uh, PhD at, I believe, 2012 at Yale, uh, and then since 2018, he's heading the lab uh, at uh, University of California, Merced, uh, with a main focus on nanomechanics, nanotribology. Uh, so he's a real expert on experimental nanotribology, and we're very much looking forward to your talk, Mehmet. OK, thank you very much, Andreas, for the uh, nice introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today in this uh, nice community of colleagues working in various arts of tribology. Um, as already indicated, my name is Mehmet Baikar. I'm an associate professor of mechanical engineering at UC Merced. I've been a professor before in Turkey at Bilkent University. I see uh, some people from my former group here in the audience, so it's a pleasure to virtually see them as well. Um, today we're going to be talking about the nanotribology, so tribology on the nanometer scale of uh, an interesting material, molybdenum disulfide, which we will refer to as MOS2 from now on. We will be taking a look at uh, what we call atomic scale ripples, and we're also going to take a look at what chemical dopants do to the nanotribological properties of MOS2. Um, these are quite specific topics, but what I will try to do is give you a, a general introduction uh, to, the, to the field. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with friction since you're here in the audience, but considering there may be some students who are just starting out, etc., I still kept my introductory slides and I'll go over them quickly uh, just to give you a broad overview of uh, what is being done currently in the field. 
And then I will move on to uh, our specific experiments. So without further ado, let us start this, um, uh, this presentation. Okay, right there. All right, so this is our introductory slide for friction. This is uh, something that you have seen if you have, ever, uh, if you have ever seen a talk from me before. So uh, apologies for the redundancy, but for those who are new to the field, this may be useful. So friction, when you think about it, it's uh, pretty much a universal or what we call a ubiquitous phenomenon that we essentially face every day, everywhere in our everyday activities, as mundane as walking or writing with a pencil, whatever you can think of that involves mechanical action, usually involves friction as well. So you can think of mechanical or industrial processes where friction is also prominent. Uh, this may include large scale manufacturing operations, you're uh, punching holes in a sheet metal or doing things like that uh, in a large plant, or you think about your internal combustion engine that you have in your car, pistons moving up and down in cylinders, etc. Friction is a big part of all of these processes. So we usually think of friction as a, a source of major energy loss in engineering. Well, of course, you know, energy is never lost. What happens is that you uh, take usable mechanical energy and just convert it to forms that you cannot immediately use in a mechanical system, such as heat or sound that are essentially wasted. So that's why we use the term loss here. Um, if you open up any textbook about friction, read the first chapter, or if you sit down and try to write a proposal to get some research money for doing friction research, what you talk about is usually in the introductory part, the, the economic impact of friction. You will see that um, a few percentage of the gross domestic product of a developed nation, let's say the USA or I don't know, uh, Italy, uh, it's lost every year uh, due to effects associated with friction, such as wear, you have to replace lubricants, you have to replace parts, uh, etc. So that's a, that's a huge amount of money. Of course, as scientists and engineers doing fundamental work, we are not really interested in the monetary side of things, but we're really interested in the, in the physical and, and scientific aspect uh, of things. And we are lucky because friction is very much an active research area, as you all very well know. Um, the basic physical principles of friction, we do not completely understand yet. That one equation that you, we all remember from high school that relates the friction force to the um, normal force acting between two bodies that are in relative motion against each other uh, through the what we call the friction coefficient, that is an empirical equation, something that has been deduced through experimentation, um, actually hundreds of years ago by people like Da Vinci, Amonton, St. Coulomb, and uh, we still learn that in high schools today. So um, that means there's a lot of gap in understanding, especially from a first principles point of view, and that's why I thought uh, Professor Rigi's presentation was particularly interesting, because there is no overarching theory of friction that would explain every single sliding scenario in terms of the friction forces that you would expect to have. So this is still an open area of research pretty much. And therefore there's a huge need to understand um, fundamental principles of friction. And this is uh, what we are aiming to do today, at least uh, covering a very tiny portion of this. Uh, when I say fundamental, what we usually mean is fundamental length scales or fundamental time scales. And fundamental in the sense means we're very small or very short. So that means we're going to be looking at very short length scales today with an instrument that we call the atomic force microscope, the AFM. So um, we're going to come to that. But before that, let's take a look at the second aspect of this talk that is of interest. So we're looking specifically at friction of two dimensional materials. It's an aspect of this talk, but also an aspect of this whole uh, webinar series that is dedicated to 2D materials. Again, I assume like um, almost all of you in the audience know what a 2D material is, but just in case there's a new student or somebody who is new to the field, a two-dimensional material is essentially a single sheet of material that consists of individual atoms. So imagine you take some atoms, put them together next to each other, form a two-dimensional pattern, and you just end up with a single sheet or maybe a few sheets on top of each other. That would be what we call a two-dimensional material. Well, of course, this is interesting from a geometric point of view because you're kind of approaching the ultimate length limit. But at the same time, this is also interesting from um, a fundamental point of view because when you think about two dimensional materials and their discovery, if you will, in 2004 with this uh, nice paper in science by Gaim and co workers, Gaim Novoselov and co workers, they exhibit extraordinary physical properties. These typically include electronic properties, and that's what most people choose to focus on. But in a, specifically in our community, we are interested in the mechanical properties of two-dimensional materials. Of course, graphene is very famous as being the first 2D materials, the interesting electrical properties of has been studied, but then other 2D materials followed as well, such as molybdenum disulfide, hexagonal boron nitride, and many others such as the enzymes that have been discussed in the previous talk. 
Today, we're going to be focusing on MOS2 specifically, as the title implies. And then we're going to be taking a look at the mechanical properties of MOS2. When I say mechanical properties, we're going to be specifically looking at frictional properties. Just to give you an idea about the importance of this field of 2D materials research, uh, six years after the publication of this paper, a guy named Noah Sello were awarded, uh, awarded the physics prize, the Nobel Prize in physics. This is really fast as far as Nobel prizes go and shows how much interest the scientific community has shown this particular uh, class of emerging materials. Okay, so um, we know about friction, we know about 2D materials, so why do we care about the friction of MOS2? Well, in its two-dimensional form, when it consists of only a single layer or a few layers, MOS2 can be a suitable solid lubricant for applications that involve very small mechanical systems. So when I say very small mechanical systems, we're talking about nanoscale or microscale electromechanical systems or simply mechanical systems for which traditional lubrication schemes such as applying oil between the gears of a macroscopic mechanical system, et cetera, do not simply work. Well, there are size effects, of course, um, surface to volume ratio becomes really high uh, for these small machines and then effects such as surface tension, et cetera, essentially make these um, traditional liquid lubrication schemes unusable for such small mechanical systems for which we typically consider solid lubricants. And if you have very small mechanical components, what you need is a small scale lubricant. And that's why you're talking about the 2D form of solid lubricants of which MOS2 is a prime example. Specifically for MOS2, space applications are also very important because unlike graphite or graphene, it's um, lubricational properties improve rather than degrade under vacuum conditions, which are prominent in space. So, um, some real world examples, you may have heard about the um, James Webb Space Telescope that has been recently deployed. Almost all components in that space telescope that involve moving parts, they are lubricated either by MOS2 or some sort of composite that involves MOS2. Uh, so there are real world applications of this in space right now. If you think about some of the rovers that are discovering or exploring Mars at the moment, um, these rovers also have feature a lot of moving parts and they're also lubricated by some sort of MOS2 based lubricant mostly. So, um, and this is really important because if you send a, a mechanism or a device or, or vehicle to space, and then you suddenly have failure of a mechanical component, suddenly one arm doesn't move or you cannot deploy a, a sail or something like that because of a lubrication failure, you cannot simply go there and fix it uh, because it's out there in space. So what you have to do is really design your lubrication schemes very well and plan for every eventuality such that you, you maintain functionality as you are uh, operating in space. So that's why it's quite important for space applications. This is why the research I will present today has been actually um, funded by NASA as we will see on the last slide. Well, so much importance on space applications and therefore we have to understand the fundamental frictional properties of MOS2. Today, I will be specifically talking about two properties and isotropy and layer dependence. And we will be studying these on a very small length scale as already discussed on the nanometer length scale. Well, how do we do that? We employ a method called atomic force microscopy, AFM, which happens to be my favorite experimental technique. Since my uh, grad school years, I've been working with AFMs. Um, so an AFM is um, what I describe or what many people describe as a mechanical microscope. It's not an optical microscope that you are perhaps used to from high school biology class. It's not an electron microscope like the SCMs or the TEMs you may have used or have seen used before at your institution. This is a different type of microscope. It's a simple mechanical microscope. What it really does is it's a, it's a cantilever, micro machine cantilever, maybe a couple hundred microns in length. That can change, of course, depending on the application. But the heart of this instrument is the very sharp probe, this super sharp needle that we have at the end of the cantilever, if you will. This probe is so sharp that ideally it has a single atom at its end, okay? And then what we do is we take this very sharp probe, bring it very close to the sample surface that we want to investigate, establish very light contact with the sample surface, meaning that the tip pushes on the sample with forces that are on the um, order of a billionth of a Newton, so a nanonewton, and then we scan the tip on the sample surface. Of course, we know as surface scientists that there is no such thing as an ultimately flat surface. Every surface has some sort of uh, corrugation associated with it, even if it's just atomic corrugation. So what happens is the tip, as it scans on the surface, tracks these topographical features on the surface by dipping into or uh, going above or deflecting away from the surface. And by using a feedback loop and keeping your deflection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hello? Sí, Vika. 
Um, Clayla, I think your micro microphone is on. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, so, so if now, sorry about that. We're, we're good, right? You can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I was just describing how an AFM works. It's essentially a super sharp needle that is pro mechanically probing a sample surface. With that, you can get very nice high resolution maps of surfaces on the order of um, resolutions on the order of nanometers and sub nanometers that you simply cannot get with an optical microscope. But at the same time, this mechanical microscope does not only map surfaces, but it is also a very sensitive or, or very precise force sensor. What it does is it measures normal forces between the tip and the sample surface by tracking the deflections of the cantilever in the normal direction. And by keeping track of the twisting of the cantilever as it moves over the sample surface, you can also keep track of the friction forces that act between the probe tip, between this very sharp tip, and the sample surface you are tracking. That's why it's a very nice instrument to use for very small scale friction measurements. The big advantage is that we can think of this very sharp probe essentially as a single asperity or a single asperity contact that is established with the sample surface. This is very much in contradiction with a typical friction experiment uh, on the macroscopic scale or the, even the microscopic scale, where you have two surfaces sliding on top of each other. You don't know how many asperities these surfaces have. You don't know their distribution. You don't know their sizes. So whatever friction information you get from that uh, macro scale or micro scale uh, sample or experimental setup is very hard to interpret because you don't know the geometry of the contact. Here, you just have a single asperity tip. So you have a fairly good idea about the geometry of contact and whatever results you get in terms of friction forces, you can interpret very nicely. Um, that's why AFM has been used for nanotribology research for a long time, maybe since uh, 1987, uh, ever, um, the, first, the first ever paper on uh, friction force microscopy, which is AFM used for friction, has been published. And what you can see here is a, um, just a um, benchmark example or just a sort of a proof of principle measurement where you have a map where we have a, a graphene flake. This is this dark area that has been expo exfoliated on a silicon dioxide substrate. Um, this is a map of friction that has been obtained with the AFM. So the darker regions mean lower friction and the brighter regions mean higher friction. This very nicely shows as with this map and also by keeping track of this red arrow here with the friction profile, you can see that this single layer of graphene acts as a very good solid lubricant on silicon dioxide by reducing friction greatly, uh, as you can see from this comparison right here. So this really shows these layered materials like graphene or MOS2, they can act as solid lubricants on the nanometer scale. More importantly, it shows that you can use AFM to keep track of these things and measure friction forces on very small length scales. Now, okay, after this very uh, broad introduction to uh, friction, to the materials, solid lubrication and AFM, let's go to the actual body of what we will discuss in this talk. And the first topic we will discuss is friction and isotropy on 2D materials. And isotropy, of course, means direction dependence. So what we are talking about is the direction dependence of friction, specifically on 2D materials. Why do we care about this? Well, it's an important design parameter. If you um, come up with a solid lubrication design for, let's say, a nanoscale machine that you're going to send into space, you want to know if friction changes drastically when you, one component moves in a certain direction and that the same component moves in a different direction. So you will have different levels of friction you have to account for, and it's an important design problem. Um, this was first discovered, um, the fact that friction is direction dependent on 2D materials, was first discovered by the group of uh, Miguel Salmeron at Berkeley National Lab in this nice paper in 2011. They essentially took a graphene flake recorded friction on it. It has different domains on it, as you can see, and different levels of brightness gives you different levels of friction. As you rotate the flake, they observe that friction actually changes on these domains as a function of direction. And what they discovered was a um, periodicity of 180 degrees period. So they had a minima and maxima in friction, depending on which direction you were scanning in. And these oscillated with a period of 180 degrees. In order to explain their fun findings, uh, they proposed a model where the 2D material, in this case graphene, that they use um, to probe friction on, features out-of-plane undulations, or what we call ripples. And this is a typical phenomenon with 2D materials. Uh, they tend to crumple up and form these ripples, either due to elastic interactions with the substrate on which they have been put, or simply when they are freestanding as an internal phenomenon. So these ripples, these parallel aligned 
um, undulations or out-of-plane deformations exist on almost 2D materials. And what Salmeron and his group proposed was that when the tip was sliding, the tip of the AFM was sliding parallel in perfect alignment with these ripples, it doesn't face too much topographical resistance. And therefore, the friction force you will record when sliding parallel to these ripples would be quite low, so minimal. The other extreme is when you flip your scanning direction by 90 degrees, and now you actually move over the ripples. So when that happens, uh, what we have is uh, what we call maximum friction scenario, where you have to overcome a lot of topographical resistance to move forward. So that happens after 90 degrees, and F2 would be the maximum friction. Flip another 90 degrees, and you're back to F1. So that's where the 180-degree periodicity comes from. Despite this nice and uh, interesting um, explanation, the, the ripples have not been observed during the experiments. And on top of that, many experiments that followed actually showed that periodicities other than 180 degrees were observed on different 2D materials, and sometimes even non-periodic behavior. So the question is, why is this happening? In order to answer this question, let's talk a little bit more about the ripples. If you go ahead and take a look at this 2007 paper from uh, Fasolino and colleagues, you will see that the formation of the ripples is thermodynamically required for the stability of 2D materials. If you go ahead and try to make a two-dimensional, perfectly two-dimensional crystal, with calculations I understand nothing of, you come to the conclusion that this perfect, ultimately flat 2D sheet of crystal cannot exist in a stable fashion, and it forms um, strains that are relieved by out-of-surface relaxation. So this rippling is an internal property of 2D materials. They have been actually observed, so they are not just theoretical. They have been observed through electron microscopy on, say, few layer graphene, as has been shown in this nice nanolators paper. The question now is, can we see these ripples on MOS2 with, uh, with the atomic force microscopy method? So not with electron microscopy, but with AFM. Why? Because this is the method with which we measure friction. If you want to relate any aspect of friction to the formation of these ripples, we have to see the ripples with the AFM and then make these, form these connections. Next question is, considering that, or assuming that we can see these ripples with the AFM, can we study their effect on force and energy interactions between the tip and the sample surface, such that we can hopefully make conclusions about things like anisotropy, et cetera? So to answer these questions, we go back to the AFM method. And um, just a quick reminder that what I described to you before as the um, operational mode of AFM or the operational principle of AFM is the basic operational mode that we call the contact mode. Um, the nice property or the defining property of contact mode imaging is that the tip is always in contact with the sample surface. And that ultimately means that a probe tip that may have been originally atomically sharp becomes a little bit blunt when it touches or when it makes contact with the sample surface. Contact at these small length scales simply means uh, a, a lot of repulsive interaction between the two bodies that are uh, arranged on top of each other. And as repulsive interaction leads to the rearrangement of the structure of the tip apex, such that something that may have been originally atomically sharp doesn't become so and becomes blunter once contact is established. That, of course, leads to a um, decrease in the spatial resolution. Instead of a very sharp probe, or in this analogy, uh, instead of a very fine finger, you will suddenly have a very fat finger that is scanning over a sample surface. And if your finger is big enough, you wouldn't be able to realize the existence of this little crack on the table if it was a completely dark room and you were just using your sense of touch to feel topography on sample surf on, you know, on your environment. Now you take this analogy and make this really, really small. So your finger suddenly becomes the AFM tip and the tabletop suddenly becomes the sample surface you're looking at. Everything is the same, but just much smaller. Now, a blunt tip doesn't tell you a lot about the surface topography in terms of precision, but a fine tip would. So the answer to this problem came in about 1995, and there was a method of non-contact AFM that was discovered by Giesel and colleagues. Again, in the interest of time and without going into too much detail, in non-contact AFM, the tip is kept in the attractive interaction regime between the tip and the sample surface. So you never actually establish contact between the two. Despite not establishing contact using proper electronic means, you can detect interaction forces between the tip and sample very precisely. And because you're not establishing contact, your tip stays very sharp. You have a very fine finger, in other words, and then you can see very fine features on the sample surface. This is a nice fit for our goals because these atomic scale ripples are really fine. 
from theory and from electron microscopy measurements, they're expected to be only a few angstroms in height. So these are really atomic scale features. Okay, so let's jump to the results. What you see on the left-hand side is a friction force map that we have obtained in contact mode on MOS2. You have different layers here, a flake with different number of layers, two, three, and four. And as the number of layers increases, you can see that the um, friction signal decreases. This is a puckering effect that we will talk about later on, but it's very common, very universal for 2D materials. Well, nice map, but you don't see any ripples here. Let's go ahead and try a method that we call the tapping mode. This is in between contact and non-contact. Here you are actually oscillating your, um, your probe. You're establishing intermittent contact with the sample, not con continuous contact, but intermittent. You're literally tapping on the sample surface as you are tracking it. But this one also doesn't give you any evidence of ripples. This is a nice MOS2 flake here. Uh, perhaps could have been um, imaged a little bit better, but you can also see on the left a few uh, terraces, different numbers of layers, etc. But again, no evidence of rippling. Finally, when you go ahead and apply the method of NCAFM, non-contact AFM, you are able to see individual undulations on the surface that are linearly aligned with respect to each other, that are parallelly aligned with respect to each other. So take a look at what I show with these arrows. These are lines out of plane deformations in the MOS tube that are only on the order of two to four angstroms in height. And their spacing between each other is also 10 nanometers or multiples of 10 nanometers, not multiples, but 10 nanometers or larger, let's say. And that is also consistent with the expectations from theory. So with non-contact AFM, you are indeed able to observe these ripples on the MOS2 sample surface, something that you wouldn't or you weren't able to do with contact and tapping mode AFM. Okay, we can also go ahead and study the effect of these ripples on the potential energy interactions between the tip and the sample surface. Again, we use a method called 3D AFM. Let me not go into too much detail, but with this method that we introduced a while ago, uh, when I was a grad student, what you can do is you can go ahead and completely map the three-dimensional potential energy landscape between a tip and a sample surface in a three-dimensional volumetric map. And when you do that, you observe that as you get closer to the sample surface, let's say you start far away and you get closer to the sample surface with your tip, you do this over six nanometers and you see that the corrugation in energy interactions associated with these ripples increases quite a bit from five milli electron volt to 30 milli electron volt. In this case, these are average values associated with all the ripples we have in this image, meaning that as the tip and the sample get closer to each other, there is a non-negligible effect of the ripples on the potential energy landscape. Once contact is established, it is, it is um, projected that this increase in energy corrugation will also have a non-negligible effect on friction behavior and therefore anisotropy. Okay, so um, now comes the question of why we see uh, sometimes periodic behavior in terms of friction and isotropy on 2D materials, and sometimes we don't see this. And the answer is in, the, in this map that I present on the left, this is a large scale map of MOS2, a topographical map. And as you can see, there are different regions on MOS2 that either feature or do not feature the ripples. If you take a look at this area highlighted by the white, you see ripples that are linearly aligned with each other. So if you accidentally landed here in your AFM experiment, you did your friction measurements by rotating the sample, you would indeed see something that very closely resembles a 180 degrees periodicity. If you, however, landed up here in this area that I highlight with the blue, you see there are no well-defined ripples in this area. So when you do your experiments here, you would actually see no signs of regular anisotropic behavior. So this non-homogeneous distribution of ripples on the sample surface, which is um, nevertheless a, a complicated function of the tip and sample of the of the tip and flake, sorry, of the substrate and flake interactions, um, depending on where you land on the surface, you can or sometimes cannot see this periodic behavior. For details of this work, I will kindly direct you to this paper that has been published last year in 2020 in MPJ 2D materials and applications. Now I see I'm running a little bit behind in time. I have just 10 minutes left. So, I, but I will. I still want to show you the rest of the talk. So I'll do a, a somewhat of an, an expedited job. So now we have talked about the friction and isotropy on MOS2. What I want to do is I want to also talk about the layer dependence of friction. So what does that mean, layer dependence? Well, this term again came about, or this feature again came about in the 2010, 2011 year range, in this particular case, 2010, again in a science paper, uh, this time by the group of Rob Karpik at UPenn in collaboration with scientists at Columbia. 
What they have seen was universally, whenever you go ahead and do friction measurements on flakes of 2D materials, you record that friction decreases monotonically with increasing number of layers. So you go from a one layer sample to two and three and four layers, et cetera, you will always see a decrease in the friction, okay? Didn't matter if you looked at graphene, MOS2 or hexagonal boron nitrate or niobium diselenite, you would universally see this kind of behavior. Question is why? Um, the idea that Karpik and colleagues came up with is called puckering. So again, using an analogy, imagine you take your, and lots, of, lots of finger analogies here, but that's, that's what an AFM is really. You take your finger and put it on, let's say your, your bed sheet, okay? And you will immediately realize that the bed sheet crumples up around your finger, puckers up around your finger. And as you slide it over, uh, you will see that this, this pucker kind of moves with the tip, okay? Now, put a few more bed sheets on your bed sheet and make it five or 10 bed sheets, okay? Suddenly it's a lot stiffer in the vertical direction. So when you put your finger there with the same amount of force, the puckering will be much less. That means there will be much less of an area increase around the tip. And therefore for a stiffer sample that consists of multiple sheets, you will get a smaller area of contact between the tip and the sample, and therefore very rudimentarily a smaller amount of friction. So higher number of layers, stiffer sample, lower friction. That's the idea behind puckering. Question is, can we either suppress or even reverse this seemingly ubiquitous trend? And this is what we tried to answer about 10 years after this paper has been published. The route we will pursue is chemical doping. So chemical doping is an interesting phenomenon that people use to influence the physical and chemical properties of 2D materials. You can find tons of papers in the literature, but this is mostly done with purposes in, in catalysis, energy storage, or sensing. Question now is, can we dope materials chemically and see what happens uh, to mechanics? In this case, this layer dependence of friction. And this is what we tried uh, with some collaborators. Doping essentially means introducing foreign atoms, foreign materials into, the, in, in, into your two-dimensional material. They can go either in between the layers or substitute some atoms in the layer, change the structure of the material really. Okay, so this is a result that we have obtained on standard or undoped molybdenum disulfide. As already indicated, as the number of layers increase, as you can see in this map on the left, and the quantification of what you visually see in the map on the right, the friction values decrease significantly as you move from one to five number of layers, so five layers on this individual flake. That's expected and in line with whatever has been published in the literature. Now, if you repeat this experiment on a rhenium doped MOS2 sample, so if you go ahead and take a look at a flake that has been exfoliated from a rhenium doped MOS2 crystal that has been grown by our collaborators at Arizona State University, the group of Sefa Tongai, you very interestingly see that this behavior is reversed. Even with your bare eyes, you can probably see that the uh, three layer flake here has a lighter complexion, if you will, than the one layer area right here. So friction actually increases here in a non-negligible manner as you go up in number of layers. Well, thinking this may be a one-time thing, we repeated these experiments, different flakes, different tips, same tip. We tried all sorts of combinations and you essentially get the same result. This is another interesting flake. It has a huge two layer region, but then suddenly jumps to 11 layers, et cetera. There's some interesting behavior towards the end, but what you see is essentially when you go from two layers to high number of layers, friction increases again in a non-negligible fashion, as you can see right here. So this is a repeating phenomenon. The question is why? In order to answer this question, we first looked at parameters that we could assess with the AFM. This includes roughness. We went ahead and took a look at the topographical roughness of the flakes, specifically as a function of number of layers and did not see any trends that would explain this interesting reverse or inverse behavior of layer dependence of friction. Everything seems more or less the same on rhenium doped MOS2. Adhesion is another parameter that you can access with the AFM. You go ahead and record adhesion forces on these different number of layers on these flakes. Again, you pretty much see that there is not a difference here that can explain what we have seen in the experiments. Now, what else can you do? Well, with the AFM, this is pretty much what we can do, but there are other methods with which you can probe your surface. And Raman spectroscopy is one of them. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through how Raman spectroscopy works, but essentially very quickly, you shine some sort of laser light on the sample surface with a fixed wavelength. You track the wavelength of the light that comes back from the sample. You take a look at the difference between the two. This is your Raman shift. What happened to the energy that is lost in between the process? Well, that energy went into shaking the lattice of the sample. In other words, lattice vibrations, different modes. You can have shear vibrations, you can have out of plane vibrations, et cetera. 
For MOS2, we have two prominent vibrational peaks at well-defined Raman shift points. Comparing what you have for undoped and doped MOS2, you can see for both single layer and bulk samples and anything in between, you can see one consistent trend. For the doped samples, the intensity of the peaks drop. So when you go from the black to the red curves, both here and here, um, well, you see that the peaks do not really move that much. What happens is that the intensity really drops. You go ahead and take a look at the chemical doping of 2D materials literature in the field, and you quickly realize that this is a, a very signature um, feature of what happens when dopants intercalate between the layers. So taking a look at similar examples from literature, we therefore here propose that the um, rhenium atoms that have been introduced to MOS, into MOS2 actually intercalate between the layers. And this is now being um, supported by density functional theory calculations that are being performed by our collaborators at UC Merced, specifically by the group of David Struby. But that's not the only thing that our collaborators do. In addition to confirming that intercalation is the most likely scenario for these chemical dopants, they also, they're also trying to find an explanation for why this would need lead to an inverse relationship between to, an, to a proportional relationship between the number of layers and the friction we see on 2D materials, the inverse of what everyone has seen until this point. The working theory right now is that uh, the rhenium atoms we have intercalated between the layers lead to a stiffening effect in the out of plane direction. That makes sense. Well, this is a stiffer spring, if you will, and then this one alone. And then on top of that, for a given volume of material that is probed by the AFM, assuming we have a constant number of dopants in that volume, which is a fair assumption, the higher number of layers you have, the less that stiffening effect will be. Because if you think about springs in series, if you have just one very stiff spring and a soft spring on top, the stiffness of that whole structure is going to be more than another structure that has a stiff spring, but then three lighter springs or less stiff springs on top of it. So higher number of layers, in other words, higher volume, leads to a less a decreasing of the stiffening effect. And therefore, uh, you will have a scenario where you have almost reverse puckering and then higher number of layers will give you a higher amount of friction. This is a working theory. They have some preliminary results here that support this idea. C33 here is your um, out of plane elastic constant. Uh, and then this is inverse volume right here, which shows as you go to the left, volume actually increases. And with increasing volume, you have a decreasing uh, a decrease in your elastic constant, which means it is it becomes easier to um, deform these layers when compared to the scenario where you have a smaller number of layers, therefore higher friction for higher number of layers. Again, this needs um, confirmation through various means, but that's the working theory right now. I see I'm already at the 34 minute mark, so I'm yeah, right on time, I think, exactly at the end. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. And again, thanks to Andreas, Philip, and the other organizers for uh, thinking of me when thinking of speakers. Um, we are frequently updating our website. So if you're interested in what we do, what you have seen in this presentation, but also other things that we do with the AFM, please take a look at our website. We are also on social media. If you're on Twitter, uh, please consider following us. We will follow you back. And uh, funding for this work has been provided by NASA. Uh, via the NASA's Mace Merced Nanomaterials Center for Energy and Sensing, which we call Macy's. Um, this is a picture of UC Merced right here. Many people ask me where Merced is when they hear about Merced. It's in California, as you know. Um, therefore, I'm showing this map. It's not really near the places where you would go to California by default. So it's, it's actually in Central Valley, very close to Yosemite National Park. So if you're ever in the area on your way to Yosemite National Park, you will more than likely drive through Merced Please consider giving us a call. We'll show you the lab and maybe have lunch or coffee or something. Thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I think it was a, a brilliant overview from the very basics uh, to the research that you're actually doing. Um, very interesting. Also, this new theory coming up. Um, I think there are already uh, a, a couple of questions uh, in the chat, uh, which we uh, may want to check now. Um, uh, there's a question. I, I, I have the feeling that you have answered it, but maybe you can give a quick answer anyway. Uh, there's a, what is the reason behind the formation of these ripples uh, and are they uh, of the same size? 
Uh, this is a good question. The, the size, let me answer the second one first. The size of the ripples, well, there's a range uh, of sizes that we have observed and other people have observed as well. But what I can say is their, their height from the base of the sample, if you will, it's, it's limited by one nanometer. So uh, it's always less than a nanometer. And typically, in our experience, below five angstroms. So they're, they're pretty light. They're very um, fine features, if you will, in the out of plane directions. The spacing between them is usually a few, I mean, not a few nanometers, but typically at 10 nanometers and higher. If you go and take a look at the theory of the formation of these ripples, you will see that these values match with the expected theory, more or less in the same, in the same domain. Well, why do the ripples happen? There are two reasons. There is the intrinsic reasons, re reason that I tried to uh, somewhat cover by taking a look at this or by showing you this paper, really. Um, if you go ahead and take a look at this paper, it kindly, it, it's very precisely explains what's going on. It's a bit on the theoretical side, so it uh, takes a while to understand what's going on, and I'm not here to claim that I fully understand it. But, but from what I hear from people working in 2D materials, for a long time, people didn't think that a 2D material can exist, simply because of a simple calculation that shows thermodynamically you cannot have a perfect two-dimensional sheet of a uh, crystalline sheet of material. You mm -hmm. had to have, well, Okay, the answer, of course, came afterwards in the sense that, well, you can have it if you introduce out of plane deformations. So yeah. even a free standing film, if you have just a bit of rippling there, uh, which is on the order of what we see in the experiments, then that makes the film stable and then it can stay that way. Um, there is another reason for the formation of ripples. This is only true for uh, 2D materials that are exfoliated on or, or placed on substrates. Depending on how the flakes are sub placed on the substrate, Usually what happens is one side of the flake goes on the substrate first and then another side goes there, et cetera. And there's a lot of residual stress that remains in the film when that happens. When I say film, I mean the flake. And that residual stress is relieved by out of plane deformations. So that's also a secondary mechanism of rippling, which in many cases leads to ripples that are again on the same size regime as the intrinsic ones. So it's kind of hard to distinguish between the two. Uh, Tony Hines from, uh, from Colombia has a very nice STM paper about this, where I think they are able to distinguish between intrinsic and um, induced ripples, but uh, one has to probably go and take a look at that paper. It's a nanolators paper from maybe 2011. So please take a look at that. Right. Um, there's another question coming up. Um, does the doping change the layer spacing between the layers? Maybe the intercalation increased layer spacing leads to increased buckering. Yeah, this is a very good question. And what, this was one of the first ideas we had and we tried to see based on our AFM measurements, if there is a noticeable change in the spacing between the layers, uh, whenever we have a doped sample versus an undoped sample. And the answer is we, we came to the conclusion that th there is no noticeable change, at least as far as our AFM experiments can tell us. But then we actually went ahead and took a look at the, um, um, at the predicted concentration of dopants in our samples. And it looks like that concentration is really low. So for an area that is probed by an, typical area that is probed by an AFM experiment, we expect only maybe one or two dopants. So that's about it. And yeah, I, apparently their effect is seen in the stiffening, but one or two dopants, I wouldn't expect to see too much change in the, mm. in the interior spacing. So that's probably why we weren't able to see that. Yep. Right. Um, there's a question about the fabrication of MOS2, if it was by, done by evaporation or by mechanical steering. Um, these MOS2 surfaces are simply exfoliated with a scotch tape from a bulk yeah. sample. So literally as Gaiman Nomosello did in 2004, you take your little bulk crystal, put your scotch tape on it, pull it back and then pull the scotch tape on top of itself and fold back a few times go ahead and place it on a silicon dioxide wafer, pull it back. And uh, if you look hard enough, you will see flakes that are uh, small in number of layers. That's the right. literally scotch tape, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another question. How to remove uh, possible potential environmental or mechanical effects in non-contact mode while discussing ripples? Yeah, this is a good question. Non-contact AFM requires a very, um, pristine and clean environment to operate effectively because you have to remove essentially all kinds of contamination on the sample surface in order to um, be able to detect tip sample interactions in a, a unperturbed manner. That's why it's pre predominantly done in ultra high vacuum conditions. 
all the all the NCAFM stuff that I've shown you today is done in UHV. Okay. So uh, this is done by our collaborators in McGill. Um, and uh, they have a UHV system there that can do non-contact AFM. Uh, I mean, I had one, but we built one essentially when I was at Yale as a graduate student, but um, we don't have access to it anymore. So we had uh, colleagues at McGill perform these experiments. Um, so yeah, it's done in UHV and we, we essentially eliminate all environmental effects there. Very nice. Um, there's a question related to the flexibility of 2D materials. Does the dope and ionic size relative to those in the parent layer affect the frictional properties of the material? Yeah, again, all, all very nice questions. So I, I yeah. think, yeah, I mean, I like this, I like this audience because finally, yeah, yeah people have questions that we have been thinking about. Because usually you go to APS and then present for 10 minutes and, you know, uh, maybe there's one person in the audience who knows about friction. Yeah, and, yeah these, these questions are very good, yeah. Um, yes, uh, we expect that the dopant ionic size will have an effect on the frictional properties of the material, or at least in the way that... Um, some ionic sizes will not be able to be accommodated in between the layers. And some of them, actually smaller ones may prefer to, or larger ones may prefer to substitute molybdenum rather than go in between the layers. Mm. That is actually what the, what the DFD simulation suggests, but we didn't have any other doped MOS2 samples to compare this theory with. So, uh, so far we're stuck with terrenium and that's why we cannot experimentally answer this question yet. But intuitively, yes, I expect this behavior to change especially when you go from an ion size to a different ion size where substitution is preferred or intercalation. Mm. I'm sure then we will see something else or perhaps just the usual um, invert, like, like regular layer dependence of friction on MOS2 for such a sample. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a, a question about like kind of aging. Do you think that these ripples will increase with time? Mm -hmm. Um, so as far as the time scale of our non-contact AFM experiments go, we haven't seen them change. They were, they were stationary. Um, what I'm thinking is with enough interaction force, especially in the repulsive regime between the tip and the sample, uh, one, would be, one would be able to suppress these ripples and push them into the sample surface. Um, however, with time, we haven't seen any changes. But then again, uh, an AFM, a non-contact AFM scan is done maybe you need high resolution start over a few minutes, maybe eight, nine minutes. You do this for a day or so, and this is what our collaborators have done. They have not seen any changes in the distribution or uh, the structure of the ripples. So um, I can't answer over a span of weeks or months, but over a day, we haven't seen a change, let's say. No. Um, last question until now. Um, so there's a question related uh, if these layered structures have any kind of risk or elastic effect um, due to self-assembly and if it's possible to study that by, by AFM. Yeah, that's something we haven't considered before. Um, for a viscoelastic effect uh, during, during scanning, how would we be able to see that? Um, maybe a, like a time-dependent hysteresis loop study or something like that. I don't know, maybe. Uh, but I think molecular dynamic simulations can shed better light on this. I don't have a very good idea of how we can, um, how we can see this uh, in, the, um, uh, in a regular AFM friction experiment. So that I'm not sure about. But again, good, a good question that I think molecular dynamics would be good at answering. Um, yeah, they just popped up to another one, uh, but goes towards the pretty, um, pretty the same direction. Uh, do you think um, that the dope and ionic size affects the ripple effect? I think we believe yes, right? That was the, um, the, the conclusion. Okay, I think the answer I gave was related to intercalation versus substitution. Now, I think right. Felix wants to know about, about the ripple effect. Probably yes, because it seems to affect out of plane stiffness and ripples are very much, ripple formation is very much related to out of plane stiffness effect. So yeah, one can perhaps perhaps do that. We haven't done any ripple imaging studies on our doped samples. So uh, that's a good that's a good idea. Maybe if we do it there, we will see something. Else. Yeah. Excellent. We uh, I believe that we had a, a very fruitful discussion. Um, I see. I see one more one more question. Oh yeah. Really. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, have we ever seen self assembled molecules on graphene? I know people claim they have seen self-assembled molecular <laughs> structures on graphene. This is a very hotly debated topic in, in, in NCAFM imaging of 2D materials. We haven't seen, no. Um, and we, 
a reviewer asked us about this. How do you know these are ripples and not, um, not self-assembled monolayers or lines of molecules on the sample surface? We had a good and eloquent answer, which I definitely cannot remember right now. But I think what we did was we, we, we took, we took um, stiffness maps, high resolution force spectroscopy maps on the sample surface. And if there was any difference in mechanical behavior in the, in the area that you are imaging, say these lines are different molecules than than MOS2, you would see a signature effect in terms of how they respond to a tip pushing on them in terms of stiffness mm -hmm. and adhesion, et cetera. And we have not seen anything. This was absolutely um, homogeneous for us. And I think that was our argumentation for these ripples being really ripples and not some uh, self-assembled monolayers on the sample surface. Yeah. Um, Zahra sees it. Yeah, definitely. I, I, yeah, there are many papers that see this. We, we just haven't seen them before, yeah. Excellent. So I think now we we have this was the longest webinar that we have been hosting so far. We we approaching uh, one hour forty five minutes. Um, so um, that just shows that there are a lot of things to discuss, and it's a uh, there are very exciting topics uh, to to really do some some work on. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, first of all, to Clelia. Second of all, to to Mehmet. Uh, both very inspiring talks. One from the numerical side, the other one very much from the experimental side. Uh, very nice discussions. Uh, maybe some some new ideas coming up uh, for for future research. Um, and maybe the the closing. Uh, I'm going to give I'll give up to to Phil. Yes. Thanks again, also to Clelia and Mehmet from my side was a very interesting uh, webinar session again, which was also reflected by the uh, yeah, many and very good questions we got to the speakers. And with that, I wish everybody a good day, a good night. And I thank again our sponsors, the two MDPI journals, Codings and Lubricants, Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Artec Instruments. And yeah, I think if any other questions come up to Clelia or to Mehmet, you can email them to us via the Eventbrite, Eventbrite webpage and we will pass them along. And with that, uh, thank you very much for listening and we see you for the next webinar. Thanks yeah. everyone. Thank you. Yeah, the next webinar is gonna be held by, by Rob Karpik, also an opportunity that should, you, you should not miss, I believe. Thank you very much for, for joining us today and uh, I wish you all a good afternoon, good day or good evening. Take care. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Take care. We also invite you to submit your research to three current special issues in coatings, lubricants or frontiers in mechanical engineering. You can find the links to the special issues in the comment section below the video. Introducing the most advanced universal tribometer the MFT 5000. With a modular architecture platform design, it is a robust surface testing instrument engineered to evaluate friction, wear, mechanical properties of materials, as well as lubricants over time. The MFT 5000's open XYZ stages and wide range of interchangeable modules and sensors allows users to self-implement and add on customization and combine several tribology tools, all on one device. These diverse modules accomplish various motions for any application and are capable of speeds from 10,000 RPM to 500 Hz oscillation. The complement sensors achieve millinewton to 12,000 newton wide force range with options of strain gauge, piezo, and capacitive multi-dimension force sensors. The Lambda profilometer, combined with the patented inline design, coincide to analyze any surface, including glass, with ease. Because of its unique four imaging modes, the profilometer produces 3D information by creating sub-nanometer surface images automatically. A fully automated and simple software interface integrates the data, enabling researchers to design and conduct tests at nano, micro, and macro levels. To simulate real-life scenarios, the tribometer comes with several environmental control options that allows testing minus 120 to 1200 degrees Celsius temperatures. 
These interchangeable chambers are skilled in evaluating high pressure, vacuum, humidity, salt spray, and tripo corrosion conditions. Due to its multiple possible configurations, the MFT-5000 is used extensively across a wide range of industries, including oil, biomedical, semiconductor, coatings, automotive, electronics, materials, aerospace, and many more. On this platform, all types of tribology tests are possible. Our tech instruments, leading innovation in tribology and surface test instrumentation.